Hello everybody, my name is Brandon. Welcome back to the channel. I am here today with my April 2020 media wrap up. So this is going to be all of the movies I watched and all of the video games I played in April. If you want to see what books I read last month, definitely check out my April book haul. I will try to, not book haul, my April book wrap up. I will try to put that up in the cards here above so that it's easy to access. Today, I only have four things to talk about. So hopefully this will be a, a bit of a shorter video, but hopefully you'll enjoy it just the same. All right. So with all that said, let's dive right in. The first movie I watched this month was one that was on my to-be-watched pile, and that is Shazam from the DC Extended Universe. So not only does this qualify for my uh, finishing of the DCEU universe, but it's also a 4K film. So I was able to lower that percentage, which if you watched my pickup video, I didn't lower it at all, but you get the idea. So this one came out last year, I believe, even though I'm not seeing a release date on it, but I think it was from 2019. Um, and essentially it is the origin story of Shazam. So I've never read any Shazam previously. I don't really know. I didn't really know anything about the character coming into this at all. Uh, the only way I would have potentially read Shazam is if he was a character in the Injustice graphic novel series, but I really don't think he was, um, but he, if he was, I forgot about him, if nothing else. But so th this fellow is Billy Batson, who is a 14, who's this kid here. He is a 14 year old boy who is essentially the chosen one, I guess, for lack of a better term. He gets the ability to turn into a superhero by saying the word Shazam. Uh, we follow at the beginning of the movie, follow how that happens, but eventually, you know, that does. And we see him turn into this superhero. So by just saying the word Shazam, he can turn back and forth between a 14-year-old boy or this amazing superhero. So I didn't know anything about this coming into it other than the, you know, I've seen part of the trailers before and I knew it was going to be a comedy superhero film, which I enjoy. And I, <laughs> I was just blown away by this. I loved it. It was so much fun. David F. Sandberg directs this and he is able to find not only the comedy and really highlight that, but there's just, there's some really heartwarming moments in this too. Uh, it, it's so much more than just a, you know, typical superhero story. The interesting part with Billy Batson is that he is an orphaned boy. He was separated from his mother at a young age and uh, basically through his teen years have been spent trying to find his mother. So he runs away from all these orphan, uh, not orphan orphanages. He runs away from all these foster families and is trying to hunt down his mom. Uh, eventually he comes into contact with the most recent foster family, which he's planning to run away from, of course. Um, but it is... One, an incredibly diverse family, so that makes it just interesting to watch. Um, but the way the interactions are handled are just so sweet and so genuine that I just, I thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, does the movie go in places I wouldn't expect? Eh, not really, but that's okay. As soon as this, you know, as soon as the, this family was introduced, I knew exactly what I wanted to happen. And so it was just a matter of will it happen or will it not and I just, I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. I think it's one of the more under-discussed uh, superhero films re of recent years, if not underrated. I don't know really what the critics think of it or anything like that, but I don't hear anyone talking about this, and I think it deserves it. I really want to learn more about the character of Shazam, so I want to check out check out some graphic novels, uh, stories from him, uh, just to see if he is as interesting as the film makes him out to be, and I really want to watch him more in the DC Extended Universe, so I'm interested to see more from Shazam. I love this movie. Um, I gave it four and a half out of five stars. I loved it that much. I did watch this on 4k and i will say uh you know it looks great there's nothing major in it that stood out as like a wow moment when it came to the hdr or just the 4k picture overall but it did its job it did exactly what it needed to and i thought it looked really good um you know i won't i wouldn't put it up there with one of the best 4k releases i own but i am glad to own it on 4k so you know take that for what it's worth so i like i said i ended up giving shazam from 2019 four and a half out of five stars the second and last movie I watched last month was actually a miniseries, and this one was on my March TBW and then moved over to April, and I thought it might have made it to May, but I was able to sneak it in at the end of April, so I can talk about it now, and that is Stephen King's The Stand. So this was a four-part miniseries that was released in 1994, directed by Mick Garris, and it was adapted by Stephen King himself, so you'd expect good things, but... If you've watched my book versus movie video on The Shining, you know that that's not always the case. So if you don't know, The Stand is a story of a pandemic that sweeps across the nation, killing 99% of the population. It is a strand of the flu. 
And the really, though, it is a story of good versus evil, which coming into the book, I didn't realize that at all. But that's really what it is. So you have Randall Flagg as the evil and you have Mother Abigail as the good. So we meet a large group of characters and eventually they all converge together to, uh, you know, either Mother Abigail's side or Randall Flagg's side as represented by the crow on the cover here. So what I loved about the novel was most mostly was the political intrigue that is involved in the story. Uh, so basically the entire middle of the book I thought was just fascinating because of all the politics that go on. Watching it be developed and then watching it, you know, play through was so cool to me. And really everything that happens from that moment of them converging on is really, you can see the fingerprints of the political system that they've created behind all of it. And so <laughs> the fact that the Stand miniseries cuts literally all of that out, except for like one scene, some of the characters are talking about the fact that they want to get to a, a group of people together uh, to, to lead, I guess. Outside of that one scene, they talk virtually nothing about it. Uh, and that was super disappointing to me. In reality, when I play hit play on part three, I thought I was missing something. Like I thought I missed this, uh, one of the parts because they jumped so far ahead. Uh, all of the character building, I guess the character building is here, but the world building is not. And if there's anything that the miniseries should have done is speed up the novel. The novel is super long. It's like a fi almost a 48-hour audiobook, over a thousand pages long. Obviously, you can't fit all of that into the stand, uh, into the miniseries, and I didn't expect that. But what it decides to cut and what it decides to keep, I think, is a little bass backwards. Uh, I should not be saying that the miniseries was boring, but my goodness, I was bored throughout almost this entire thing. I will say, part one was really well done. You know, <laughs> aside from the fact that you have a, like, Billy Ray Cyrus lookalike playing Randall Flagg, the dude was in this blue jean jacket suit and had his mullet going. It looked like he stepped straight out of an early 90s uh, country music video. It was fantastic. He looks ridiculous, but that's totally fine. Outside of that, you know, I thought the first part was really well done. But then you get into part two, part three, and part four, and I was so bored watching through this. I just... Man, I couldn't handle it. I did not like this at all. I thought it was such a letdown compared to the incredible work that Stephen King does in the novel. You know, some of the acting is really well done, but others and some of the minor characters is almost laughable. Like Stephen King plays a role in this and <laughs> he doesn't do a very good job. Fortunately, he's a, he's a minor character, but he's just not very good in it. Um, I don't, it's just, this was not enjoyable to watch. I thought it was boring. Uh, the story is, you know, it's still the story, but it's just lacking all of the, the, the detail, all of the heart that really made the novel worth reading. So I really don't recommend this one. I ended up giving the stand one and a half out of five stars. Next up on to video games. And this is probably going to lose some people because of specifically what these video games are. But the two games I played this month were both wrestling games. I've just been in the mood to play some wrestling games. My idea was to start with the 2K games. So start with WWE 2K14 and work my way through to 2K20, which is at least for now the last in the series because 2K21 just got canceled recently, fortunately, because 2K20 is a hot mess from you know everything I hear. So I started with 2K14. To, I was going to play through the My Player modes on all these, but it turns out this only has Universe mode, does not have My Player. So I instead of going through the, there is this WrestleMania mode, which you know is fine. It's just not really my cup of tea. I hate having to do specific. Um, moves or specific moments in matches while I'm playing them. And so, I don't know, that turned me off. So I don't really care about playing through that, but playing through my universe mode or universe mode, I think it's called, was uh, not that great. Um, they, the AI booking in universe mode, which essentially, if you don't know, universe mode is you create your WWE universe. You can, you know, set uh, brands. Um, you can have shows on any night you want. Um, only one show a night though, of course you can have, you can bring back WCW. If you want to do that, you can pull in all elite wrestling, whatever you want to do. You, you do it. You do what you want to do. Um, you can use creative characters in it, things like that. Of course, now the servers are down, so I don't have any, um, downloaded characters or wrestlers, but you know, you do what you do. So I created a wrestler and decided, Hey, once I'll consider this game beat once I win the world title on whatever brand I end up on. So that's what I did. I had like, a 
I think it was a WCW or no, it was an ECW and an NXT brand competing head to head. Uh, my creative character ended up winning the um, world title on ECW close to WrestleMania. It took me quite a while. It was after Royal Rumble. Uh, but I ended up winning it eventually, so I considered that game beat. But I did play through the full year, so I could see every different pay-per-view that they offered and things like that. And I just the AI booking on this is so terrible. Like if you're if there's a rivalry set, basically that's the main event for every single show. Like it was like Undertaker versus John Cena, literally night after or week after week after week. It was so stupid. So the game itself, not that great. Uh, I, you know, I appreciate it for what it was. Uh, moving into 2K15, I actually, I like this one better. Their, <laughs> 2K did not do a great job with the series, and they never have. But I can see the improvements in some places in 15. And I can also see where they kind of didn't do any improving and, and kind of downgraded some things in 2K15 compared to 14. So, you know, I, not much else to say about this. I am This is the alternate cover art. That's the original cover art. It has the rock. Um, but... I don't know. I, I just was disappointed with the the booking in this. I thought the AI would have done a better job considering that we've had GM mode in the past and they do a relatively good job of booking. So I don't know what the heck was going on here. So I don't know. It is what it is. I played through the full year. I beat it. I'm ready to move on. I gave this one, I think three stars, it says. I gave this three out of five stars. So and last but not least is on Xbox One, WWE 2K15. So this was one I've never played before. 2K14 I had played in the past and I uh, just played, started playing it again. 2K15 I've never touched before a couple, you know, a couple weeks ago. So again, I started with, uh, they did introduce my player mode in this or my career mode it's called. And um, I realized that there was a glitch that you couldn't change the difficulty level. Now, I know we've talked about this in the past, but I like to play on easy because that's what I find most enjoyable. So you can't do that here. Normal mode was just pissing me off. And so I just said, you know what? Forget this. I, I can't play on the mode I want to play. I'm just not going to play it. So I ended up moving to universe mode. So now as I work my way through these 2K games, I'm just going to end up playing a year of universe mode. Assuming my creative wrestler, you know, wins the world title, I will then consider it beat and move on to the next one. So the universe mode here, just as bad as 2K14. The AI booking is just as ridiculous. Again, you'll see John Cena versus whoever he's fighting against, you know, whoever the rivalry is. You'll see that literally week after week after week. It'll be different match types, but it'll be the same match. And then finally, at whatever the pay-per-view is that month, you'll finally get a title match. But if, you know, the person retains, then you're just going to keep seeing the same cycle. It's just, it's bad. The gameplay on this, though, I think is a step down from 2K14. Basically, all these 2K games are, are reverse fests. You're just hitting, you know, R2 or L2, um, yeah, R2 or RT, sorry, uh, on the Xbox controller, like the entire time, because the only way to do anything if you're down or groggy is to reverse a move. And so these games have just become reverse fests, which interests me <laughs> very little. I don't enjoy it. So WWE 2K15, I did beat this one, but I am still playing it because I want to play through at least to WrestleMania. I ended up winning the world title uh, sooner in this than I did in 2K14. So I'm going to play this a little bit more just to get to WrestleMania mode. So I haven't rated it yet, but it's not going to be any higher, probably lower than 2K14. So WWE 2K15 was another game I played last month. Didn't really enjoy this one either. And frankly, I think uh, that it is a step down from the previous gen's WWE 2K14. So, so if you are interested in any in playing any of these uh, WWE games for whatever reason, you know WWE 2K19 is still the best of the bunch that I've played out of the 2K series. But really, if you want a wrestling game, you got to go back to uh, you know the WWE SmackDown series. Here comes the pain. Um, just bring it. Games like that are really where it hit its prime. So. WWE 2K15, I'm not going to rate it yet, but it's probably going to be about two and a half, three stars when I'm when it's all said and done. All right, so that's going to do it for my April media wrap-up. Those are the two movies I watched and the two video games I played last month. Hopefully, you and guys enjoyed this one. Let me know down in the comments below, what did you watch? What did you play last month? Anything good? Anything I should check out? Let me know down in the comments below. I'd love to have more of a conversation with you guys down there. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please, if you're not already, consider subscribing to Cinefessions here on YouTube. And if not, thank you anyway for watching. I really appreciate it. All right, guys, so that's going to do it for today. I just want to say thank you all so much for watching, and I'll catch you next time. <laughs>